Good morning and welcome to King's Church. I'm David, I'm one of the pastors here and we're excited to have you worship with us this morning. Uh, Matt Trexler from RUF UCLA, um, Reform University Fellowship, which is the college ministry of our denomination, will be guest preaching for us today, so be looking forward to that. But before we get into our time of worship, a couple of quick announcements. The first is the VBS donations have raised over $660 for Wilson and Sheila, and we're, we're so thankful for your generosity. Um, it's gonna go towards their family garden, and we know that they are very thankful and blessed by your love and your, your gifts, so thank you for that. The next announcement is that we have a family scavenger hunt coming up next Saturday. Uh, we'll be meeting in the Commons parking lot at 10 a.m., and if you don't know what this is about, hopefully you can check out the, the week announcement by Jill or um, her announcement last Sunday, but basically families will be gathering and really anyone can come as a group and they'll be given clues and go to different locations around Long Beach and um, gather back and there'll be prizes for the winner who whoever is able to complete the scavenger hunt first they'll gather back at the Commons parking lot and we'll enjoy some uh, some popsicles on what may be a hot day. Uh, please sign up by Wednesday by emailing jill at kingschurch.us. And we also need more volunteers to help hand out the clues at our different locations. So if you're interested in doing that, it shouldn't take longer than about an hour and a half. Please also email jill at kingschurch.us. Our third announcement is that we are actually going to be transitioning to live streaming our services on Sundays. What you're watching right now is a recorded service. And... Um, the reason we're doing this is because we want to kind of get back into a Sunday rhythm and especially as we look forward to potentially, you know, when we'll be able to meet back in person. Um, we encourage you to watch it live as sometimes YouTube will take over 24 hours to process the video. So you may not be able to, if you don't catch it live at 9.30 a.m., um, you may have to watch it the next day. So we encourage you to join us live. And we'll also have a live Q&A afterwards where you can submit questions about um, you know, about church, about what we taught, uh, really anything via either the chat or, uh, or text as well. And the last announcement is that we, would, we wanna have a live uh, in-person communion service at Los Altos Park on September 20th. And this will be happening after our live streaming service at 9.30, and it'll be happening at 11.30 a.m. Um, it will be a much shortened service, and we, 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 we're doing this because we want to um, be able to serve communion and for you to um, experience that grace during that time. And we will have more in the future as well. So um, please put that on your calendars, and if you can join us, please do that. As we transition now to our call to worship, it comes from Psalm 24, and it's a reminder that God is a conquering God. He's, he's a victorious God. He has defeated our greatest enemies, sin and death. And the reason why we need to remember this, why we need to be reminded of God's victory and his power is that uh, so often we, we look at the world around us and we um, are fearful. We, uh, lose, we, are, we lose hope in, in what is happening. Things seem to be getting worse than getting better. And really this psalm is kind of echoed in the New Testament when Jesus tells his disciples, take heart for I have overcome the world. So let's keep that in mind as we uh, enter into our call to worship. Please respond at the bolded words. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Up your gaze. 
be lifted up till everyone our great love love come down from heaven's gate to kiss the earth with hope and grace sing who is this king of glory the lord strong down at heaven's gate to kiss the feet of hope and grace and sing who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty strong and mighty. There is one God, He is holy. There is one Lord over everything. There is one, He is Jesus, King of glory, strong and mighty. You are the King of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty. Oh 
As we enter now into a time of confession, um, we know that it's Labor Day weekend, and for many of us, that means the start of kind of the new school year, and with that comes a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions about what, what the future will hold. Um, will we be able to get back in school again, and, and just what's going to happen um, in the next couple of months? And it's just a reminder that um, though God is certain and we can hope in him, uh, it, it's a reminder of our own weakness, our own, our own frailty, and even our sin when it comes to fear and anxiety. So let's bring all of that before God in this time of confession, and let's confess together. Father, we confess that our hearts are weak. We are anxious about the months ahead. We fear the future. We are not at rest, and our actions show that we do not truly trust you. Together. Forgive us. Revive us. Grant us new strength and greater faith to believe in your promises, your character, your victory accomplished through the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior Jesus. In his mighty name we pray. Amen. Please take a moment now for a silent confession and prayer. Hear now the assurance of God's love that nothing can separate us from him, that he is for us. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all. Bye. 
This morning is from John 11, verses 17 through 27. This is what Holy Scripture says. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. May God bless the reading of his word. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Matt Trexler. I'm the RUF campus minister at UCLA, and it's good to virtually be with you this morning. Uh, We are looking at one of my favorite passages in the Gospels, uh, John 11. And I I really love this passage because I think it's so honest. And it kind of asks the question, you know, what do we do with our sadness? What do we do with our anger? I think sometimes growing up in the church, I was not really good with talking about emotions or even expressing emotions, um, unless it's like joy. But what do we do with very real pain? And I think that's actually what this passage talks about. So before we kind of dive in, let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, um, this has been a year. And Lord, um, we don't always know what you're doing in it, but we trust that you're birthing new out of the old, Lord, that you are with us. And I pray now, Lord, that you would speak through this word in this text. Uh, Lord, that you would come off the pages to meet us in our sadness and in our anger and our fear and our frustration. Father, I pray through the power of your spirit that you would show us Jesus, your son, that we may trust him and love him. In your name I pray. Amen. I love movies. Um, I actually, something I deeply miss in 2020 is going to movies. And actually, one of the movies that I really love is Wonder Woman. Um, If you're not familiar with the movie, at least you're probably familiar with the comic book. Amazon goddess superhero Diana. And her entire mission is to save people from evil and death, right? And she, in this particular, in the movie that just came out a few years ago, this American soldier named Chris Pine takes her from her island to go and fight in one of the world wars against the military death machine that is Germany. And she is ready to go. She wants to fight in the battle. But she notices that Chris Pine's character kind of always keeps her away from the fight. He's kind of always kind of leading her behind enemy lines, so to speak. And she's like, when are we actually going to fight? When are we going to fight? And there's this one scene where they're in the dugout, right? And there's this fighting going on around, and she wants to get into the fray. She wants to get into the battle. And he says, no, Diana, you can't. You can't save everyone. And she says, I can. And there's like powerful music starts playing, and she kind of climbs the ladder out of the dugout, and she surveys the landscape of violence and death, right? And she charges headlong straight into it. And I think that's a picture of John 11, because in this passage, Jesus looks at the things that we cannot defeat at evil and death, and he charges straight into it. You see, it's been my experience Uh, that we usually don't tell people when we are sad. We don't tell people when things are actually falling apart. Even as a pastor, it's very hard for me to admit on the days where I'm not doing very well um, that things are not not easy. 
And no one suspects at that time that inside our heart is breaking and our head is screaming. But this passage says that Jesus knows and Jesus sees. And we're going to see that he comes to his friends, Mary and Martha. And he comforts Martha specifically with the words, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And he asks not only her this, he asks us that as well. So what I want to do is I'm going to walk through this passage and some of the surrounding context of it because I really love this passage. And I want to look at it in three ways. That Jesus waits, that Jesus weeps, and that Jesus wakes. My former REF campus minister, when I was an intern with REF, uh, outlined the passage that way, and I can't help but see it that way anymore. So kudos to Sammy Rhodes for coming up with that outline. Go give credit where credit's due. But we're going to walk through it this way. First, Jesus waits. I hate waiting, and I know that you probably do too. This is why I hate the 405. This is why I hate when my phone freezes up or that spinning wheel of death pinwheel of death comes onto my laptop, I want to like chunk it against the wall. This is why I hate waiting in Trader Joe's for like an hour and a half to get milk and eggs. I hate waiting. And if anything 2020 has taught us, it's that we are an impatient people. We hate to wait. And what I want you to see in this passage is Jesus and his disciples hear that their friend Lazarus is sick and is dying. And Jesus doesn't go, all right, we better get to work. We better like Boom, you know, burst over there as soon as possible. I'm Jesus. I'm going to swoop in and heal him. He says, no, let's wait a few days. Let's just wait. And he lets Lazarus die. And he makes Mary and Martha, his friends, wait. How does that sit with you? It says that he loved them. He loved them. It's not like he didn't care. It's not like I've got more important things to do. We'll get to that when I can. It's not at the bottom of my to-do list. He knows. And he says, no, we're going to deliberately, I'm going to deliberately wait. How do you hold those two things together? He loved them and he made them wait. I want you to feel that. This is something that I've come to learn about Jesus in walking with him. He walks very slow. Um, and he never... He never really does things on my timetable. Um, and I notice that throughout all of Scripture. Abraham, you're going to be a blessing to the world. And you're going to wait 25 years before you have Isaac. He makes Moses wait 40 years in the desert before he even shows him the burning bush. And then leads him for another 40 years. And through the wilderness with the Israelites to the promised land. David is anointed king. But Saul is still on the throne, and David has to spend 13 years being pursued by Saul as he's in caves and in Gedi, waiting. Jesus himself, the Savior of the world, 30 years makes tables and chairs in a little podunk town called Nazareth. And then his first day on the job, he goes into the desert for 40 days. He waits. See... Sometimes in order to catch up to Jesus, as one theologian said, we have to slow down. God makes us wait. It seems to be his work sometimes to work slowly. But why does he delay? Is he trying to hurt us? Does he even care? See, he knows that what they need is not just a healing of a fever, but a resurrection. He wants to do something far better that will bring this family to an unshakable confidence in who he is. And he's not afraid to let us experience sadness and disappointment. I said I loved movies. Um, for kids' movies out there at Pixar, one of my favorites is Inside Out. I think it's actually, I'm going to argue it's the best one. Um, but in that particular movie, there's this girl who has these different emotions that kind of live up in her mind. There's joy, there's like sadness, fear, anger, and joy is played by Amy Poehler, and she's kind of like the de facto leader of the girl's brain. And, and though everyone in the, in the control room of her mind, right, basically all the other emotions are trying to keep sadness from taking over, right? They don't want sadness played by Phyllis from the office to, like, touch different things because she always turns everything blue. She turns everything sad. So, like, let's make sure that 
sadness never leads. But then when joy and sadness are lost in the middle of the movie in the maze of long-term memory, joy keeps trying to take shortcuts to get back. But sadness is the one who knows the way. And it's the long, slow process. And sadness has to lead if they're going to get out. Let me ask you a question. Can God disappoint you? Can your God disappoint you? Rarely have I found this year saying, God, where are you? I've actually kind of gone to the next one, which is, how dare you? How dare you? Will you follow Jesus if the pain gets worse? If the prayers go unanswered? This is God's way, which it's, it's in those moments of waiting and wrestling that God actually does some of his best work some of his deepest and most healing work, even if it's imperceptible to us. Jesus is saying, you can trust me. We want the quick fix to people's pain. It's like we see someone in sadness, we're like, God's got a plan, you know? People are depressed, we're like, it'll get better, you know? Just, just put a smile on it, like Romans eight twenty eight. you know? Like, he'll work everything out together for good. And that's true. But when people are experiencing pain in the moment, that doesn't feel like a care package. It feels like a Bible grenade blowing up in their face. Um, and we can take passages like that and we can bludgeon people with them. But to really know the hope of that passage, you can't just hear it. You have to experience it. You have to go through it. And it can sometimes be a long waiting and suffering. And yet we trust and we hope because the passage says he loved them. But second, Jesus actually weeps. So Jesus eventually does go to meet Mary and Martha. Mary is so overcome with grief, she can only stay in the house. Martha, who I love, goes straight up to Jesus and just says, Where were you? If you had come sooner, our brother would not have died. I love Martha. Uh, she's actually become one of my new favorite characters in the Gospels. Um, you might remember her from Luke 10, where she's just like busy trying to serve Jesus, you know, and she does, she's so busy and anxious that she can't actually sit like Mary. But she's just so honest and real, I feel like. And she comes up and she is angry at Jesus. Now, here's the thing she loves Jesus. Her and Jesus and Mary and Martha are all friends. They played Scrabble together on the weekends. Like, they're, they're, they're good friends, right? So, Jesus doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't say, how dare you talk to me like that? He doesn't do that. He actually receives her anger. This is, I want to kind of look at this in two ways, which I think there are two lies that we tell each other, even in the church, or maybe to one another. And the first is that anger is not spiritual or good. You can't be angry. I'm going to say this boldly, but I think you can actually be angry at God. In fact, if you read the Psalms, you see it. Elijah in the cave. Where were you? Where are you? Why you? Like, I think many times we are too refined with God. We are too refined with God. And sometimes our anger, it can of course be poisonous. I'm not saying that. But God is not put off by our anger, as one pastor said, so long as we beat on his chest. To come before his throne and to let it all out. And that's what Martha does. She goes straight to Jesus and she says, where were you? Where were you? And Jesus is angry too, but he's not angry at them. The passage says that he was deeply troubled in his soul. He was deeply troubled in his soul. What was he angry at? I heard this story one time about a nurse who kind of told this about a family was surrounded or in this hospital room and they were surrounding their father who's dying. And as the dad breathes his last breath, the family doesn't weep, they don't cry. But what they do is they begin to tear up everything in the hospital. They begin to like smash the monitors, throw chairs, they're destroying everything. And the nurse says, I think that's the most acceptable response to death I've ever seen. They were angry at death. It's not supposed to be like this. And it says that Jesus was deeply disturbed in his soul. It almost has this idea of like a, a horse like snorting in anger. And he looks out at the grave and he is angry at death. Jesus is angry at death. Do you believe that? 
That's not the way our culture talks about it. Death is natural. Death is just a friend you kind of greet. You know, death is not evil, but actually it is. Death is the enemy, and Jesus is angry at death. And he's going to stand before the grave, and he's going to roar into the darkness, Lazarus, come out. God rages at death. God actually sees the pain that people have been through. He sees the injustice that has been happening to many people in this country and in the world. He sees people who've been abused. He sees people who have experienced incredible pain, and he actually is angry. He's angry at the pain and injustice of the world. But he doesn't just get angry. He also weeps. And this is the second lie that we sometimes tell each other. If anger is unspiritual, sometimes we'll also tell each other that it's not okay to be sad, that tears are weak. We're like, we have like Ron Swanson theology. He's like the, one of the characters in Parks and Recreation. And he says, there are only two acceptable times for a person to cry, at funerals and the Grand Canyon. Um, And as much as I love Ron Swanson, I think he's wrong. Um, Jesus was the man of sorrows. The two shortest words in the English Bible are Jesus wept. Now this isn't this isn't like like some southern lady like you know old lady like dabbing her eyes like like that kind of sad. No no no. This is like ugly crying. This is like weeping. He is breaking down in his soul. He is losing it. Psalm fifty six says, "You have kept count of my tossings and put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book?" Do you know what that means? is that God actually sees every tear you've ever shed. That every time you toss anxiously in your bed at night, God actually sees it. That he actually sees it and he actually cares. And that God's heart is moved for those in pain. He sees the homeless on the street who live in hopelessness and he sees that. He sees the broken, he sees the guilt-ridden, he sees the shamed, the anxious, the depressed, those who know that they have no righteousness, that they have no justice, those who are broken not only for the world but the injustice and indifference in their own hearts. He sees that and he weeps with us. He has compassion on the suffering. That's the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the brokenhearted, for they will be comforted. You know, I think that that beatitude of God is as wide as Jesus' love, which means it's as wide as the world. Dale Bruner, who's a comment, who wrote a commentary on Matthew, says, We have it on authority from Jesus that in deep sadness human beings are in God's hand more than at any other time. One of my favorite books is The Chronicles of Narnia um, and, uh, by C.S. Lewis. And there's this one, particularly The Magician's Nephew, where this kid named Diggory finds himself in Narnia. And back home on earth, Diggory's mom is dying. She's very sick. And he doesn't know where he is, and he sees this lion, Aslan, who's singing all of creation into existence. And he thinks, maybe this lion could do something for my mother. But he's also very afraid of the lion. But he approaches Aslan. And he he can't even look up at the lion. All he can do is stare down on his paws, and he sees the claws, and he's afraid, and his knees are knocking, and he's shaking, and he says, please, is there anything that you could do for mother? Then, this is what C.S. Lewis writes, in his despair, Diggory looked up at Aslan's face. Great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know. Grief is great. Only you and I in this land know that. Let us be good to one another. You see, if you ever doubt the goodness of Jesus in your pain, you probably will. But if you ever doubt it, look at his tears. Remember them. And sometimes it's hard to believe that he's actually more sorry and grieved over what you're going through than you are. Maybe you've experienced some really terrible things, not even this year, but in your life. It could be a messy divorce. It could be the betrayal of a friend. It could be a life-threatening disease. It could just be a long, lingering emptiness and depression and we think there's so much other problems in the world God couldn't possibly care about mine but he does he sees and he weeps and some of us try to fight back the tears we just try to keep going on right but Jesus knows Jesus knows that sometimes sadness is the way to really feel what has happened 
in the midst of sadness, we don't need sentimentality. We need the men of sorrows acquainted with grief. That's why Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me if you are burned out on all these things, if you are stressed out, if you are tired, if it feels like the juice of life has been squeezed out and all is left is, is the rind, come to me. I'm not going to give you a hard time. I am gentle and lowly in heart. I will refresh your souls. I'm not going to put something ill-fitting on you. I know I can take it. I'm with you. But this is the third and final thing. Not only does Jesus wait, not only does he weep, he wakes. He actually does something about it. See, Jesus will not let sadness have the last word. He's going to do something about it. And he actually goes before the tomb and he says to Martha, you're going to see the glory of God. And he looks out at the tomb and he's going to bring Lazarus back to life. And there's actually this really kind of funny moment where Martha's like, Lord, He's been dead for like four days, right? Like, can we get some Febreze in there, light a scented candle? Like, it's going to be really terrible. But he basically wakes Lazarus. Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Death is rolled back, and he wakes. And we see that, and we say, that's amazing. Like, we love that, but we also kind of hate that. Is this just the Bible's version of Sleeping Beauty? You're like, oh, that's nice. That's really cool that that happened for Lazarus. But my friends are still in the grave, the pain is still happening in my life. The jobs still aren't calling back. What are you going to do about that? The pain is still there. But what this passage is saying is that Jesus' resurrection power is already breaking into the world. You see, Jesus, in order to raise Lazarus from the tomb, is going to have to go into the tomb himself. And Jesus was actually raised, and he actually has unleashed a new creation power into the world, and it is already breaking into our life now. That he is actually bringing the hope. And yes, there is pain. And yes, we have experienced these things. And yes, we will probably still have scars. But Jesus has come to defeat the thing that we could not defeat. You see, if you ever doubt that Jesus loves you in your pain, look at him laying down his life. It can't mean that Jesus has quit loving you. I'll conclude with, I'll conclude with this, but one of my, again, I'm using another movie illustration. I should probably, I should probably have an editor. But um, there's this movie called The Iron Giant that came out in, like in the late 90s. It was a kid's movie. Um, and it was about this giant robot, okay, that crash lands on Earth. And he develops this friendship, you know, as most monstrous robots do, with this little kid. Um, and they, you know, they're like hanging out together, doing all these things. And the government finds out that there's this giant robot that they don't know about. And they're thinking that it's probably some you know, enemy or whatever. And so they try, they're trying to like destroy it. There's at the end of the movie, they're trying to like spray it with bullets. They're, like, they're shooting every bomb they have it and nothing's working. And so the government says, in order to destroy this giant, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to launch the big bomb. And it shoots it up into space and it's going to come down, right? And it's going to kill him. But what they don't, I guess, think about is that bomb is also going to destroy the entire town. And there's this very heartwarming scene where the giant's looking at Hogarth, the kid, and he realizes that everyone around him is going to die. And the, the giant says, hey, don't, don't, don't follow me. And the iron giant blasts up into space. And just as the bomb is curving down, he opens his mouth. And he swallows it whole. And he explodes into a million pieces. And he saves the town. And that's actually the gospel on Netflix. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that Jesus goes to the cross and in the same way. And he sees that death has wrecked his whole creation. And Jesus takes it all upon himself. Every pain, every sadness, every evil, every sin, death itself, and he swallows it whole, and he takes it in upon himself that he might bring life to us, that he might actually defeat the darkness, that he might actually conquer our enemy. He has swallowed death, and death is broken forever. It does not get the last word. And like a mighty word, he takes death and he breaks its back. And he has come to bring life. See, that's what God does with the sad things, is he makes them come untrue. It may be a journey. It may not feel like that in the moment. We are currently in the process of waiting. But in the midst of our pain and sadness and anxiety, let this verse be like an anchor for your soul. See how he loved them. How he loved Lazarus. How he loves you. In the midst of pain and tears, we need to hear, Oh, how I love you. For he gave his life for millions and for me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness and grace to us. That Jesus, 
though we do not understand your ways, that you make us wait. We know it is because you do. We know that it's not because you don't care. You do. You see our pain. You feel our anger and our sadness. And Lord Jesus, you went to the cross and you did something about it. And you've come to make the sad things come untrue. And you have come to bring healing and justice and mercy to the world. Jesus, thank you. May we trust in you even today. In Jesus' name, amen.
the heights of heaven, you step down to earth, innocent perfection, give your life for us and we are amazed, and we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross, how great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. And how great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great. How great, how great is your love for us. There's never been, there will never be. God like you, a love so true, there's never been, and there will never be, a God like you, a love so true, there has never been, and there will never be, a God like you. Love so true. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. Yeah, how great, how great, how great. And now also hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.